Let me introduce you to uh, some of our fossil collection. You recognize it? Because you see it's a fossil squid. I, I guess living in Tennessee you don't see too many squids, hey? Although you did see one in the children's talk this morning, the food that the penguin currently eats. But the reason I got this one is I noticed that the ink sack, you know how squids and octopus are famous for squirting out ink? I noticed that the ink sack was still intact. So I said to one of our research people, Dr. Diane Eager, let's see if we can extract the ink from this supposedly 100 million year old fossil. So here we are beginning the experiment. Uh, we have the slab with the fossil in it. We have Dr. Diane Eager, and in her hand she has a feather pen. Oh, why did we pick a feather? Well, we had to go down to the chicken house and pluck one um, because we wanted to guarantee that it had no previous exposure to ink. So we went and we got an original feather pen. We made it. By the way, the word pen comes from the Latin word for feather, a pinnae. Right, and so you cut one, you slice it up, you get a little blob where the ink can go in. So there's a close-up on it, and you'll notice we've managed to uh, dissolve the ink, and here it is, and what we did with it was write a word. Ah, now, what's the significance? Well, you and I live in a world where, with our subject today, many people struggle with the days of Genesis, with the six days of creation, they struggle because they think the fossils prove the world is millions of years old. Okay, that's ink. It's in brown pigment. The pigment is melanin. Melanin has a known shelf life. Easy to prove. Go to the uh, Mediterranean and ask for some good Italian cooking and you want it flavoured with squid ink, coloured with squid ink. They still use it. And the substance in squid ink is melanin. Melanin is the brown pigment in your skin. But the little bottle comes with a warning. Keep it in the fridge and don't store for more than a year because it degrades in the presence of sunlight and in the presence of air. Do you know what being able to re-extract that ink tells you? That squid was buried quickly, removed immediately from light and immediately from air. That rock didn't take a long time to form because if it did, guess what wouldn't be preserved? The ink in the fossil. We uh, have been doing a lot of collecting around the years and I've encouraged people over the years, we collect all through the USA, one of our other geological colleagues, Robert Stewart, is here today and um, I noticed him just sneaking in before, but if you want to assist our research in collecting these fossils from all around the globe that we use in schools and colleges, then get in touch with our CES group here or get in touch with us via our main website and put yourself on our prayer news list on our evidence news list, I was really pleased to hear from Dr. John Morris the other day that he said our evidence news is, is basically one of the best things available for keeping up on the latest research because we give you a summary of the scientific discoveries and then we give you all the references, then we just give you a biblically based perspective on this new find. You can get to those things from our info at creationresearch.net. You can actually see articles stored in the archives, like the recent one on the God particle. And in the relevance to today's issue on the six days of creation, God particle, Big Bang Theory, oh, the God particle actually replaces the God person. You see, you can't just come up with an alternative theory of origins. You have to replace everything that you see the equivalent of in Genesis. You have a person to start with, you've got to get rid of that person, you still have to have a start. All right, let's begin our session. For the record, today's date is what? Now, if you told me it was in August 2012, I guess that's correct in America, isn't it? But in reality, you remember Y2K? When, when many of the folks were worried the world was going to end and they moved into the, the forest and all, all sorts of interesting things happened. But they also had a big calendar display. I went to see that calendar display and they had calendars from all around the planet on display as to what year it was, including one Jewish calendar. And the Jewish calendar had marked on it Y2K which was the transition from 5759 to 5760. Hmm. And you think it's 2012. I wonder what the date 
actually is. Our program today, we're continuing to look at the six days in Genesis. And as I said before, we have lots of questions on this. It's the reason we picked this seminar to record. You want to cover other subjects that we don't get through today? Then there's lots of them on our AskJohnMackay.com website. No, it's not my job to answer all your questions, but it is my job to find experts around the world who can answer questions like, did Jesus actually believe in six days? Um, Did he believe it simply because he was an ignorant Jewish person who'd never studied science? That's out there in the theological colleges today. Okay, when I first got involved in this, a theologian moved into town and I wanted to meet him. He had more letters after his name than an alphabet. He had more degrees than a hot day. And I wanted to ask him where he stood on this issue of six days of creation. In the end, I turned the interview into a cartoon. Let me give you a uh, look at it. Here I am asking him, could the days of creation be different lengths of time? His answer, yes, definitely. So my next question, so could they be six million years long? Absolutely. Next question, so the days could actually be any length of time. Well, um, uh, yes, they could. What about six days? No. In other words, they can be anything except what they obviously say they are. Now, if I was subject to that theologian and my PhD depended on him, do you realize that many people kowtow to the system because he's going to be giving me my qualifications? Okay, what if you have a different authority? And that's what this issue is actually all about. So let's remind you, first of all, of what the Scripture says and what the Scripture, referring to the Old Testament and the New Testament, actually is. Okay, do you recognize those words? Old Testament, New Testament? Uh, I hope you do because they're not actually words that are commonly used these days you get a chance to do a testament once, correct? Your last will and testament. What is interesting is your last will and testament is actually an interesting legal document because what you discover that your Bible is actually not just a history book. It doesn't claim to be a history book. It claims to be a testament, a legal document. In fact, the argument through the New Testament is the inheritance is only valid if the one whose testament it is has died. This is a legal document. So ponder that for a moment. Old Testament, New Testament. Blank? Most people are blank. They think it's a collection of Jewish myths. They think it's a religious book. They think it's a history book. They they never consider the fact that the words testament appear both in the old and in the new, and hence we've adopted them as labels. Testament? Well, a testament is not actually like a contract. A testament is where one party makes up the rules, I hereby leave to thee, my dog, $10 million. There are some people who do this, don't they? And then when they die, all their living relatives who aren't dogs get really upset. But it's not a thing they can do about it, provided there's no errors in the testament. The interesting thing is, that when you look at testaments, they always concern inheritance. And when you look at your Old Testament starting with Genesis, or you finish your New Testament finishing with the book of Revelation, it is to deal with an inheritance. Hmm. Any errors, historically, factually, or legally, means that that inheritance is challengeable. So starting at the beginning of the testament. In the beginning, God created By the time you get to the end of that first chapter, God saw all that he'd made and it was very good. And we did this in the first session. And we reminded you that by the time you get to Exodus, you get a shortened version of it. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth and everything that is in them. And it was all very good. Okay, I've debated this subject against atheists like Richard Dawkins. I've debated, you know, professors. I've I've lectured in schools and colleges for many years. I've talked to unbelieving geologists. You know what my conclusion is? My experience tells me one thing about the text in Genesis, Exodus through to Revelation. Everyone knows what it says in Genesis, 
even when they don't believe it. So let's take a different tack in this section and ask this question. Is Genesis literal and how would you actually know? What are we doing? We're consulting a world expert. His name, Dr. James Barr. He was Oriel Professor of Interpretation of Holy Scripture at Oxford University. And by the way, that is not Oxford, Mississippi. This is the real one in England, right? Um, he was a renowned Hebrew scholar and he stated the following in a personal letter to David Watson in the UK. Now, I have a copy of this. What's the context? David Watson was in trouble. David Watson was involved in the UK education system then and he got himself into trouble by teaching that the six days were real days. Okay, now in those days there was still a Christian ethos but it was fading in the UK and the standard position was, well, you can't take a literal stand on Genesis. So uh, David Watson said, well, I'm going to consult a world expert and see what he says. Here's part of the reply. Professor Barr says, so far as I know, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university. By the way, don't the Brits have a wonderful way of putting everybody else down? At any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis, and he didn't know if it was singular or plural, 1 to 11, intended to convey to their readers the ideas that. Now what's he going to say? Is he going to sink David Watson? Is he going to pat him on the back? He's going to guard his own backside. Here's what he wrote. Um, the creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours we now experience. Wow. In fact, he goes on to say this professor from Oxford, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogies, you know, the bit we did in the first section, the length of Methuselah's life when he had a son, etc., provided by simple addition a chronology from the beginning of the world up to the later stages in biblical history. So roughly 15, 1600 years from Adam to Noah's flood, roughly 4,000 or so years from Adam up to Jesus, uh, etc. Um, he goes on to say this, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide. I guess if you read all the highest hills under the whole heavens were covered, it's pretty hard to read it any other way and extinguished all human and animal life except for those on the ark. Now the interesting thing is Professor Barr didn't say he believed this. He said that whoever wrote Genesis intended whoever read it to think that they meant... You still don't know what Professor Barr thinks at all. But what he told you is if you read it, here is what it's obviously saying. The world was made in six days and the world was destroyed in what it reads like a literal Noah's flood. By the time you go to your New Testament, Old Testament, ah, someone's rewritten the will. Isn't that what you can do too? I left all my money to my dog. Oh, and then the relatives complain, so I've changed the will and I've left all my money to the dog's cat. Um, you can do this. This is a New Testament. Okay, in Colossians chapter 1, you read this. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son. So from now on, the Son is the chief subject. And the Son you know as who? Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the first born over all creation. And Paul continues to write, For by him, this is Jesus, this is the Son of God, for by him all things were created, that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. God bless the heart of all those evangelicals in America, in England, in Australia, in the entire world who want to tell people about Jesus, but they don't want to deal with Genesis. You know where you come unstuck? When you share Jesus with somebody and they say, but who is this person? The answer... Well, think carefully. What's Paul just said? In fact, by the time we go to John's gospel, which you're more likely to be using if you want to share Jesus, it starts in the same place as Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. The Word was made flesh and dwell among us. Ah, this is the Jesus who you are familiar with. But it's just introduced who He is. He was the one in the beginning. He is God. He happens to be God who is the creator. So if you want to go any more than just using his name, 
Do you realize you can't just use his name in Spain because there's hundreds of thousands of people who are called Jesus. So which Jesus are you talking about? Oh, I'm talking about the Jesus who is God the Son. I'm talking about Jesus who is God the Creator. I'm talking about Jesus who is God the head of the church. I'm talking about Jesus who made all things in six days and he made them very good. Again, my experience is that anyone can tell you what it says even when they don't believe it. Okay, ponder that for a moment. Uh, Let your mind go into neutral and then try and draw up all the things you've struggled with in the entire Bible. You know why you're struggling usually? I know what that says, but I don't like what I think it means. Isn't that so often a problem? Hmm. I know God says, don't look at a woman in lust, and yet she is cute. I know what it says, I just don't like what it means. At issue in this whole debate, by the way, is not the conflict between science and religion. The only issue you need to be concerned with in this whole discussion on Genesis, the six days of creation is, is it true that God made the world in six days or is it false? Later on we'll discuss issues like, can you tell if it's poetry or not? But the issue will be, is it true that it's poetry or is it false that it's poetry? Because you have many so-called learned theologians saying, oh, we don't need to take the details seriously because it's just a poetic description of what God as creator did. And then they proceed to tell you all about millions of years of evolution. You see, this issue is actually about Jesus who is the creator. And isn't this the Jesus who, when he came to earth, said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus never said, I am the way, the science, and the life. I am the way, the truth. By the way, if that's not true, he is not anybody's saviour, correct? If that is false, if it is not true that Jesus rose from the dead, we may as well pack up our bags and go down to the local hotel, the local pub, the local bar, get drunk. This Jesus, the issue is true or is it false? Not science versus religion. So what things do we need to consider? Well, the first one you need to consider is if you want to concentrate on Jesus, who is the Christ, you realize the difference, don't you? Christ is his title. That's his role. Jesus is his name. Remember the angel said, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. But the Jews were looking for a Messiah. Oh, that's the Hebrew word. Go and read your Septuagint and there the word is Christ. So the word Christ was around long before Jesus was given that title in your Greek New Testament. So we're going to deal with the creativity of the one who you know as the Christ, Jesus. Okay, question. He turned water into wine. He turned loaves and fishes into lots of loaves and fishes, correct? Put the bakeries and the fishing board out of business for the day. He was good at raising the dead and he could restore sight to the blind okay question how long did he take to do those things i'm raising this because you see as you read your new testament it is very obvious that on the day they needed the food the little boy comes forward he's got five loaves and two fishes and did jesus have to work really hard for the next million years now they would have all been dead of hunger By the time he gives the things to the disciples, breaks off a bit of fish, a bit of bread, and he says, Peter, go and feed that thousand. You imagine what a step of faith that would have been for Peter? I've got a bowl with two bits in it. I've got to go and feed those people? This was a test for the disciples too. By the time they kept breaking it up, man, this Jesus is something else. Actually, he's someone else. He is Jesus, who is God, who is the creator, who does not need time. You need time. And you know what you're doing when you start to stretch out the days of creation? You're making God in your image. Because you would take a long time to do things, you automatically think he would take a long time to do things when he came to this earth as God, who is the word, who in the beginning made all things, who became flesh and dwelt amongst us, Then he turned water into wine like that. It didn't take time. He took a process, and the smarter you are, the quicker the job gets done. 
Hence, I made another cartoon many years ago, a discussion between a young man and a young lady sitting there out in the park. Six days? Yes. You're sure it says six days? Yes. Six truly really days? Yep. I wonder why it took so long. Ah, question. You want to preach Jesus? Who's this Jesus you're talking about? Well, the answer is, this is this Jesus who can take a drug addict and change him, correct? How long are you offering the drug addict salvation to take? Uh, Is it going to be two million years before he gets saved? Do you realize this Jesus actually does things that you and I have only got one? We call them miraculous, don't we? To him, they're just normal, everyday sort of events. To us, they're the things we can't do. So the issue, as I said right at the start, that's going to come up here, will deal with who do you accept as your authority? Is it Jesus Christ or is it the local scientific community? You see, if you're a follower of Hugh Ross or whatever, bless his heart, but his authority is his fellow astronomers and he defers to their studies and he uses them to interpret Genesis. Well, the interesting thing is Professor Barr said, if you read Genesis... Whoever wrote Genesis intended you to think that they meant six ordinary days, worldwide flood, simple chronologies. And you know that because that's what you read. That's what I read. When I first started to read the Bible, I wasn't a six-day creationist. I had billions of years in my head. And you know what the first thing was obvious? Shish, this book is different. As I read through Genesis, I had no trouble at all with reading what it said. My problem was... Do I really have to believe what it obviously means? Okay, I've labelled our second section, Bite the Bullets. And at the end of this section, I'm going to give you a chance to ask me a question. Now, because this is largely a biblical topic, we're saving the issue on the age of things until we move into our third and our fourth sessions. In this one, we want you to get clear, if I accept the authority of this Jesus, who is the Word, who inspired Paul who handed the Ten Commandments to Moses. You do realize that was who Moses met, don't you? That's why the writer in Hebrews said, Moses, who for the sake of Christ, not for the sake of the God who he understood as Elohim, but for the sake of Christ. Moses forsook Egypt for the sake of Christ. They knew a lot more than you and I give them credit for. So we've called it Bite the Bullet. So you can open your Bibles up at 2 Corinthians. You see, you have got a lot in common with 2 Corinthians, particularly the church in the current Western world. Corinth was not Jewish, agreed? Corinth was in what country? Greece. Corinth was a problem church. I mean, it was your standard Baptist church. People fought each other. They they committed adultery. It's a standard Episcopalian church. There were all sorts of problems in this church. You've read them. I mean, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is an embarrassment, correct? But it's written to those who would claim the name of Christ. And their background, not Jewish, but Greek. And so Paul has to explain a lot of things from step one. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. This was a wonderful scripture chorus. Uh, I remember when I first heard this sung by a choir. It was beautiful. For God who commanded the light to shine has shone in our hearts the light of the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ. Hmm, interesting question. Why did Paul use that analogy? Think carefully back in Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep. Hmm, and God said let there be? Right, what has this got to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's make you flick across to Genesis and Jeremiah. You see, I just quoted Genesis verses 1 to 3. Now I want you to look at verses 4 and 5. And God said, let there be light. And God saw the light that it was good. Don't be surprised, God doesn't do non-good. God only does that which fits with his nature. God is good. 
the first light was good. It shone into the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. The first day of the first week of the first month of the first year of the first millennium. Okay, interesting question. Was this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday? That's easy. Go to Israel today and ask them when is their seventh day? Remember we've talked about that before, Exodus 20? In six days God made the heavens and the earth and the seventh day he rested. Therefore, ah, we didn't touch this bit. Isn't this used as a basis for a law of social construction? Therefore, you will work six days and what will the Israelite do on the seventh day? Rest. God did it this way, you'll do it that way. It's a covenant between God and Israel forever. So you go over there and say, On our calendar, which day is the seventh day? Is it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday? Saturday. Actually, it's Friday evening, isn't it? It creates a bit of confusion when you get to the Easter crucifixion bit. But start from sunset on Friday evening through to sunset on Saturday evening. So equivalent to Saturday is their seventh day. So which day is the first day of the week? Sunday. The world was made on Sunday. Actually... You could start that just after, well, there was no sun, so you couldn't have a sunset. That's why it says, no light, the world was dark. And it gives you that old Jewish formula, we start our day in the evening. Because the first day started the evening and the morning were the first day of the week. Okay, over to Jeremiah 33. How's your knowledge of these prophets? How's your knowledge of, say, 1 Chronicles? Don't some of these books really take commitment? I mean, and such and such begat, such and such begat, such and such begat, such and such. These are actually there for a very real reason. These are there to connect Jesus historically to the person Adam. And it's absolutely vital that you have the connections there because Jesus had to provably be a descendant of Adam because God has a rule. Only a relative can redeem you. So if you couldn't prove Jesus was related to Adam, you could never have a saviour. It's why it's so important you realise that the Jews who are currently waiting for a Messiah are waiting in vain. You remember what happened to all the temple records in 70 AD? The Romans burnt them to the ground. You can never again establish that any single person on this planet is directly by provable chronology related back to the first man, Adam. The Messiah has come. Jeremiah 33. If you can break my covenant with the day and the night, then I will break my covenant that David should have a son on the throne. And it repeats it again in the last verse. I will break my covenant that he should have a son to rule. Okay, question. Who do you think this son actually is? It's the promised Messiah. It's Jesus, it's the anointed one, the one who will rule over all of David's and Abraham's descendants forever. Do you realize God has kept this promise? He has sent the son. In fact, isn't that the whole discussion that Jesus and the Pharisees are having? I really am this person. I'm the one promised in Psalm 110. I'm him. Do you recognize me? Okay, the Messiah has come. The Messiah has lived, the Messiah has died, the Messiah has risen from the dead, he has ascended into heaven and he's seated on the throne. Ah, God has kept his covenant. Which means that you should notice two interesting things. One is that nobody and nothing has ever broken his covenant with the day and the night. And the interesting thing is he only ever made that covenant on the first day. On the first day of the week, With the coming of the light, the shining into the darkness, God covenanted with man that we would have a saviour from the darkness. I mean, think carefully, John's gospel, and the light shone into the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. Why is he starting there? Because the whole of God's promise about a coming son was actually connected not to the seventh day, but to the first day. Oh, the seventh day is related. I mean, think carefully. Didn't Jesus spend the day in the grave? 
didn't Jesus, wasn't he resting on the seventh day? They took him down off the cross. They had to bury him before the seventh day. He spent the seventh day in the grave because alive or dead, he had to keep the law. And the law was you'll work for six days and you'll rest on the seventh. He rested on the seventh. He kept the law or you or I wouldn't have a saviour. But then he rose again on what day of the week? The first day. The one that's in Genesis chapter 1. So when you flick over quickly, how's your flicking finger? Are you rearing out a fingerprint yet? Uh, I mean, you can just listen if you like. But I tell you what, the Bible is so exciting as you go from cover to cover and see how it's all stitched. You know Psalm 118 verse 24, but you've only sung it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And because we have such little knowledge of the scripture, we think Monday's the day, Tuesday's the day, Wednesday's the day, which is nonsense. (laughs) The only day that God ever made was the first day of the week. Hmm. All the rest have been repeats. God never made the second day. God made the first day. It's the only day he ever made. And on that day, the light shone into the darkness. And God, who commanded the light to shine, has shone in our hearts the light. Do you see what Paul's doing? You're Greek people. You don't understand this. I've got to take you all the way back to the beginning to see where this is coming from. So don't be surprised if you're really quick and you can flick over to Luke chapter 24, you can see this prophecy fulfilled. This is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. And in Luke 24, yes, Jesus has just met the disciples on the road to Emmaus and they didn't recognize him at all, correct? Up until he opened the scriptures and their eyes, the scales fell off them. I'm pretty sure on that day he started at Genesis chapter 1 and he proceeded all the way through to Psalm 118, right past Malachi and he said, it's me, I'm risen from the dead. You see, they needed to be reminded because were they convinced that they had salvation when he died on a cross, when his blood was shed as a sacrificial innocent lamb? Nope. What were they doing? running as fast as they could. Were they convinced when he was buried in a grave of a rich man as the prophecy said in the Old Testament? Nope, they were still running. When were they convinced? They met him on the road to Emmaus and and he said to them, why do you look so glum? And he said, haven't you heard? This Jesus of Nazareth, they crucified him. Oh, we thought he was the Messiah. (laughs) Wake up, you idiots. I mean, he's pretty harsh in what he says to them. And beginning with Moses, he opened their eyes to the scripture. I'm going to ask the Lord for that video replay of that Bible study. It'll be better than any I've ever done. But you see, the passage I want you to look at is verse 35, 36 through to 45. Because Jesus just meets a couple of them on the road to Emmaus. And then he appears to the disciples. And the interesting thing is he didn't come through the door. You put yourself, here you are, you're moaning, you're groaning, your standard sort of Christian experience, you, you're upset. And all of a sudden, somebody comes through the wall. <gasps> That's what he did, he just appeared. Okay, and then it talks about them being frightened. But then it says, they were so overcome with joy, they couldn't yet believe. Do you realize, hey, this is Jesus, because the first thing he said was, look, Here, if you're critical of Thomas, he did exactly the same to every other disciple on that day. Here, look, it's me. Touch my sides. Feel my hands. They were so overcome with joy, they couldn't yet believe. Their brains were into joy mode. They hadn't started to think about it, but they knew one thing. It's him. He's back. He's risen from the dead. It really is him. By the way, if he had risen from the dead, what did they now know they had? salvation their sins could be forgiven because the lamb of god had been slain they had been granted life in accordance with god's promises from the sacrifice in the garden of eden to the shedding of blood in egypt to the sacrificial lamb all through the old testament the substitute had been made but this time not a lamb a man for a man now they had it oh let's rejoice That's what we should be. So glad on the day the Lord has made. By the way, what day is today? Sunday. 
This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made and we should be glad and rejoice in it. You know the rest of the psalm? God has opened a door, the righteous shall enter. You have become my salvation. And by the time you get down to verse 27, God is the Lord who has showed us the light. That's the connection. Okay, have you ever noticed the jump from Genesis 131 to the last sections of Revelation? And God saw all that he made, and behold, it was very good. You are trying to share Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just God. You know the mysteries of the Trinity we could go into today that show up even in the way you finish choruses. Did you notice when we sang today? You know the, how they love to repeat things at the end of songs? Your normal way of repeating is to sing it three times. Think through. And how many, how many bears are there in that story? How many little pigs? The three little pigs. We pick three all the time. We are made as the reflection of a triune God and three times lucky. Ah, interesting, the way we, we use three everywhere. Genesis 131, God made everything good and this God is none other than Jesus and this Jesus built into Genesis a physical picture that one day the spiritual light would shine into the spiritual darkness. He built into the physical picture of redeeming a physical nation from physical bondage when Israel was redeemed from Egypt to go to a physical promised land. He built that into a spiritual promise that you and I would be taken from spiritual bondage to something far worse, sin and death and hell, and be delivered into a spiritual promised land, a new heavens and a new earth, where how long will you live for? Forever. And you will never be troubled by the Discovery Channel again. You will not be plagued by Reader's Digest advertising. You will never have to vote again. You won't be worried about the economy. And as I keep telling, you get promised a brand new body. This one is doomed. I know some of you realize that. That's why you spend so much on trying to patch it up. You know it's on the way out. In reality, rejoice more that your Savior, who is Jesus in Genesis, became the Redeemer in John, who is the promised deliverer in the book of Revelation. You try and get through sharing Jesus without dealing with Genesis. You want to start only with John, and your Jesus is this big. You need a Jesus who is all. You need a Jesus who's not just the Savior. He is Lord. He is Creator. He is Redeemer. He is God. And He has left us a legal promise. Not just a history document. A, he's left us a testament. Okay, blank. Bring up to your mind. What do we say about testaments? You got it there yet? A testament is not just a story. A testament is not just a moral point. A testament is a legal document. And it has to be without error, historically, factually, and legally. And can I warn you, all of God's enemies know this, and most of the Christians don't or they ignore it. You see, that's why when you look at the attacks on Christianity, you don't see the same kind of attacks on Buddhism. I mean, have you read books attacking the evidence that Buddha ever existed? It's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. All that matters is his ideas. Have a look at the attacks on Christianity. There's no way you could believe in the six days of creation. Noah's flood couldn't possibly be real. Where did all the water go to? How did he get dinosaurs? You can't believe that. Well, the attacks on Christianity are factual. Or they are logically legal. Hey, what's this got to do with Israel? Where does this... I mean, you can't believe Israel's important. Well... The New Testament is a legal document and it's covenantal in construction. God made the rules and you and I have no option but to accept them and the reality is they have to be without error historically, factually and legally. It's actually all about Jesus. It's all about eternal life. That's the inheritance. If there's a single fact of error historically, legally or factually, guess what happens to the inheritance? Same as what happens when you leave your $3 million to the dog and you made a mistake in signing the will. After you die, what will your relatives do? Tear the will to pieces and challenge the inheritance. And that's what Satan is busy doing. 
That's what the theory of evolution is about. That's what all the challenges in your law courts about where do you draw the line on what's right are all about. The legal ramifications, the historical and factual ramifications of replacing Genesis with the ancient Greek myths of evolution. I had to smile the other day, and this is my closing thought. I had a skeptic write in and say, how dare you suggest we teach creation in our schools? Your search for the origin of life course, you may as well teach all the ancient myths. My reply, that's what they're teaching at the moment. They're teaching the ancient Greek myth called evolution. What's your problem? Ah, all of this is actually about Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the... And you have no life eternally without him being exactly who he says he is. Correct? But it's written to those who would claim the name of Christ. And their background, not Jewish, but Greek. And so Paul has to explain a lot of things from step one. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. This was a wonderful scripture chorus. Uh, I remember when I first heard this sung by a choir. It was beautiful. For God who commanded the light to shine has shone in our hearts the light of the glory of God through the face of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Interesting question. Why did Paul use that analogy? Think carefully back in Genesis. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered the face of the deep hmm and God said let there be right what has this got to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ let's make you flick across to Genesis and Jeremiah you see I just quoted Genesis verses 1 to 3 now I want you to look at verses 4 and 5 and God said let there be light And God saw the light that it was good. Don't be surprised. God doesn't do non-good. God only does that which fits with his nature. God is good. The first light was good. It shone into the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening the morning were the first day. The first day of the first week of the first month of the first year of the first millennium. Okay, interesting question. Was this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday or Sunday? That's easy. Go to Israel today and ask them, when is their seventh day? Remember we've talked about that before, Exodus 20? In six days God made the heavens and the earth and the seventh day he rested. Therefore, ah, we didn't touch this bit. Isn't this used as a basis for a law of social construction? Therefore, you will work six days and what will the Israelite do on the seventh day? rest God did it this way you'll do it that way it's a covenant between God and Israel forever so you go over there and say on our calendar which day is the seventh day is it Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday or Sunday Saturday well, actually it's Friday evening isn't it it creates a bit of confusion when you get to the cruci- Easter crucifixion bit but start from sunset on Friday evening through to sunset on Saturday evening. So equivalent to Saturday is their seventh day. So which day is the first day of the week? Sunday. The world was made on Sunday. Actually, you could start that just after, well, there was no sun, so you couldn't have a sunset. That's why it says, no light, the world was dark. And it gives you that old Jewish formula, we start our day in the evening. Because the first day started the evening and the morning were the first day of the week. Okay, over to Jeremiah 33. How, how, how's your knowledge of these prophets? How's your knowledge of, say, First Chronicles? Don't some of these books really take commitment? I mean, and such and such begat, such and such begat, such and such begat, such and such. These are actually there for a very real reason. These are there to connect Jesus historically to the person Adam. And it's absolutely vital that you have the connections there because Jesus had to provably be a descendant of Adam because God has a rule. Only a relative can redeem you. So if you couldn't prove Jesus was related to Adam, you could never have a saviour. 
It's why it's so important you realize that the Jews who are currently waiting for a Messiah are waiting in vain. You remember what happened to all the temple records in 70 AD? The Romans burnt them to the ground. You can never again establish that any single person on this planet is directly by provable chronology related back to the first man, Adam. The Messiah has come. Jeremiah 33, if you can break my covenant with the day and the night, then I will break my covenant that David should have a son on the throne. And it repeats it again in the last verse. I will break my covenant that he should have a son to rule. Okay, question. Who do you think this son actually is? It's the promised Messiah. It's Jesus. It's the anointed one. The one who will rule over all of David's and Abraham's descendants forever. Do you realize God has kept this promise? He has sent the son. In fact, isn't that the whole discussion that Jesus and the Pharisees are having? I really am this person. I'm the one promised in Psalm 110. I'm him. Do you recognize me? Okay, the Messiah has come. The Messiah has lived, the Messiah has died, the Messiah has risen from the dead, he has ascended into heaven and he's seated on the throne. Ah, God has kept his covenant. Which means that you should notice two interesting things. One is that nobody and nothing has ever broken his covenant with the day and the night. And the interesting thing is he only ever made that covenant on the first day. On the first day of the week, with the coming of the light, the shining into the darkness, God covenanted with man that we would have a saviour from the darkness. I mean, think carefully, John's Gospel, and the light shone into the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. Why is he starting there? Because the whole of God's promise about a coming son was actually connected not to the seventh day, but to the first day. Oh, the seventh day is related. I mean, think carefully. Didn't Jesus spend the day in the grave? Didn't Jesus, wasn't he resting on the seventh day? They took him down off the cross. They had to bury him before the seventh day. He spent the seventh day in the grave because alive or dead, he had to keep the law. And the law was you'll work for six days and you'll rest on the seventh. He rested on the seventh. He kept the law or you or I wouldn't have a saviour. But then he rose again on what day of the week? The first day. The one that's in Genesis chapter 1. So when you flick over quickly, how's your flicking finger? Are you rearing out a fingerprint yet? Uh, I mean, you can just listen if you like, but I tell you what, the Bible is so exciting as you go from cover to cover and see how it's all stitched. You know Psalm 118 verse 24, but you've only sung it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. And because we have such little knowledge of the scripture, we think Monday's the day, Tuesday's the day, Wednesday's the day, which is nonsense. <laughs> the only day that God ever made was the first day of the week. Hmm. All the rest have been repeats. God never made the second day. God made the first day. It's the only day he ever made. And on that day, the light shone into the darkness. And God, who commanded the light to shine, has shone in our hearts the light. Do you see what Paul's doing? You're Greek people. You don't understand this. I've got to take you all the way back to the beginning to see where this is coming from. So don't be surprised if you're really quick and you can flick over to Luke chapter 24, you can see this prophecy fulfilled. This is the day the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it and in Luke 24 yes Jesus has just met the disciples on the road to Emmaus and they didn't recognize him at all correct up until he opened the scriptures and their eyes the scales fell off them I'm pretty sure on that day he started at Genesis chapter 1 and he proceeded all the way through to Psalm 118 right past Malachi and he said it's me I'm risen from the dead you see, they needed to be reminded because were they convinced that they had salvation when he died on a cross? When his blood was shed as a sacrificial innocent lamb? Nope. What were they doing? Running as fast as they could. 
Were they convinced when he was buried in a grave of a rich man as the prophecy said in the Old Testament? Nope, they were still running. When were they convinced? They met him on the road to Emmaus and, and he said to them, why do you look so glum? And he said, haven't you heard? This Jesus of Nazareth, they crucified him. Oh, we thought he was the Messiah. <laughs> Wake up, you idiots. I mean, he's pretty harsh in what he says to them. And beginning with Moses, he opened their eyes to the scripture. I'm going to lo- ask the Lord for that video replay of that Bible study. It'll be better than any I've ever done. But you see, the passage I want you to look at is verse 35, 36 through to 45. Because Jesus just meets a couple of them on the road to Emmaus. And then he appears to the disciples. And the interesting thing is he didn't come through the door. You, you put yourself, here you are, you're moaning, you're groaning, your standard sort of Christian experience. You, you, you're upset. And all of a sudden, somebody comes through the wall. <laughs> That's what he did. He just appeared. Okay, and then it talks about them being frightened. But then it says they were so overcome with joy they couldn't yet believe. Do you realize, hey, this is Jesus? Because the first thing he said was, look, here. If you're critical of Thomas, he did exactly the same to every other disciple on that day. Here, look, it's me. Touch my sides. Feel my hands. They were so overcome with joy they couldn't yet believe. Their brains were into joy mode. They hadn't started to think about it, but they knew one thing. It's him. He's back. He's risen from the dead. It really is him. By the way, if he had risen from the dead, what did they now know they had? Salvation. Their sins could be forgiven because the Lamb of God had been slain. They had been granted life in accordance with God's promises from the sacrifice in the Garden of Eden to the shedding of blood in Egypt to the sacrificial lamb all through the Old Testament. The substitute had been made, but this time not a lamb, a man for a man. Now they had it. Oh, let's rejoice. That's what we should be. So glad on the day the Lord has made. By the way, what day is today? Sunday. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made and we should be glad and rejoice in it. Do you know the rest of the psalm? God has opened a door, the righteous shall enter. You have become my salvation. And by the time you get down to verse 27, God is the Lord who has showed us the light. That's the connection. Okay, have you ever uh, noticed the jump from Genesis 1.31 to the last sections of Revelation? God saw all that he made and behold it was very good. You are trying to share Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just God. You know the mysteries of the Trinity we could go into today that show up even in the way you finish choruses. Do you notice when we sang today? You know how they love to repeat things at the end of songs? Your normal way of repeating is to sing it three times. Think through. And how many, how many bears are there in that story? How many little pigs? There's three little pigs. We pick three all the time. We are made as the reflection of a triune God and three times lucky. Ah, interesting, the way we, we use three everywhere. Genesis 1.31, God made everything good and this God is none other than Jesus and this Jesus built into Genesis a physical picture that one day the spiritual light would shine into the spiritual darkness. He built into the physical picture of redeeming a physical nation from physical bondage when Israel was redeemed from Egypt to go to a physical promised land. He built that into a spiritual promise that you and I would be taken from spiritual bondage to something far worse, sin and death and hell, and be delivered into a spiritual promised land, a new heavens and a new earth, where how long will you live for? Forever. And you will never be troubled by the Discovery Channel again. You will not be plagued by Reader's Digest advertising. You will never have to vote again. You won't be worried about the economy. And as I keep telling, you get promised a brand new body. This one is doomed. I know some of you realize that. That's why you spend so much on trying to patch it up. You know it's on the way out. In reality, rejoice more that your Savior, who is Jesus in Genesis, became the Redeemer in John 
who is the promised deliverer in the book of Revelation. You try and get through sharing Jesus without dealing with Genesis. You want to start only with John and your Jesus is this big. You need a Jesus who is all. You need a Jesus who's not just the saviour. He is Lord, he is creator, he is redeemer, he is God and he has left us a legal promise. Not just a history document. He's left us a testament. Okay, blank. Bring up to your mind. What do we say about testaments? You got it there yet? A testament is not just a story. A testament is not just a moral point. A testament is a legal document. And it has to be without error. Historically, factually, and legally. And can I warn you? All of God's enemies know this and most of the Christians don't or they ignore it. You see, that's why when you look at the attacks on Christianity, you don't see the same kind of attacks on Buddhism. I mean, have you read books attacking the evidence that Buddha ever existed? It's irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. All that matters is his ideas. Have a look at the attacks on Christianity. There's no way you could believe in the six days of creation. Noah's flood couldn't possibly be real. Where did all the water go to? How did he get dying? You can't believe that. Well, the attacks on Christianity are factual. Or they are logically legal. Hey, what's this got to do with Israel? Where does this... I mean, you can't believe Israel's important. Well... The New Testament is a legal document and it's covenantal in construction. God made the rules and you and I have no option but to accept them and the reality is they have to be without error historically, factually and legally. It's actually all about Jesus. It's all about eternal life. That's the inheritance. If there's a single fact of error historically, legally or factually, guess what happens to the inheritance? Same as what happens when you leave your $3 million to the dog and you made a mistake in signing the will. After you die, what will your relatives do? Tear the will to pieces and challenge the inheritance. And that's what Satan is busy doing. That's what the theory of evolution is about. That's what all the challenges in your law courts about where do you draw the line on what's right are all about the legal ramifications, the historical and factual ramifications of replacing Genesis with the ancient Greek myths of evolution. I had to smile the other day, and this is my closing thought. I had a skeptic write in and say, how dare you suggest we teach creation in our schools? Your search for the origin of life course, you may as well teach all the ancient myths. My reply, that's what they're teaching at the moment. They're teaching the ancient Greek myth called evolution. What's your problem? Ah, all of this is actually about Jesus who is the way, the truth and the... And you have no life eternally without him being exactly who he says he is.